Susan Sue Taraskowitz was born February 15, 1965, in Massachusetts to Marlene and Ronald and was described as intelligent and determined with a heart of gold. She went to art school and dreamed of becoming a cartoonist from an early age and liked to collect Snoopy artifacts. At the age of 27, Sue was a Northwest Airlines ramp supervisor at Logan International Airport in Boston and only the second female ground service employee working for the airline. She was also the first woman promoted to her supervisor position and worked in a field dominated by men. The men she worked with made it well known that they didn't like her working in the same field as them. She lived with her parents, but her busy work schedule of overnight and weekend shifts kept her out of the house while her family was usually home. On Saturday, September 12, 1992, Sue was scheduled to work the night shift from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. Her mother, Marlene, said earlier that day, Sue seemed frustrated and impatient and mentioned before she left for work that she didn't want to go because she knew her coworkers were going to give her a hard time, but she had to go anyways. During her shift around 1 a.m., Sue offered to go out and buy sandwiches for her coworkers, and after leaving, she was never seen again. Strangely, when she never returned that night, none of her coworkers reported her missing. However, they did punch her time card at the end of her shift. Sunday, September 13th, came and went without anyone reporting having seen her. Her mother says Sue was supposed to be at a baby shower that day with other co-workers, but she never showed up. Once again, no one reported her missing to police or to her family. On Monday, September 14th, the manager of a nearby auto body shop arrived to work and noticed an oddly parked blue Toyota Tercel in the shop's parking lot. Upon investigating, he noticed a pool of blood under the trunk of the car. He quickly called police, and when they arrived and popped the trunk, they found Sue's body. Police say she was also found with the money she was going to use to buy her coworkers sandwiches. Meanwhile, her mother arrived at the police station to report Sue missing. She was told the police chief wanted to talk to her, and that's when she was told the horrific news. At first, her family assumed that she was the victim of a random attack of violence, but in late 1993, her mother Marlene found her diary and was shocked at what was written in it. It told of sexual harassment, threatening graffiti in the men's room and cargo holds, and other incidents that happened to her while working for Northwest Airlines. Marlene was certain that it had something to do with her daughter's murder. In one incident in April of 1989, a co-worker named Robert Brooks, who went by Bobby, damaged her radio twice. The two had briefly dated and there were no issues until Sue began dating someone else. In one incident, Brooks stormed into the break room, picked up her radio, and smashed it for no apparent reason in front of her other co-workers and would later threaten her. Sue asked her boyfriend to talk to Bobby about getting her a new radio. When she spoke to Bobby again, he threatened to kill her boyfriend. She filed several complaints to the airline and her union, but little was done about it. Instead, her superiors assigned her extra tasks such as cleaning bathrooms and such in response to her complaints. The harassment by her male co-workers also worsened after her complaints. For instance, she received several anonymous phone calls with the caller threatening to hurt her. Also, on several occasions, she and her boyfriend's cars were vandalized. Friends and co-workers who supported her also had their cars vandalized. Sue's diary only covered the first eight months of her time at Northwest. However, several co-workers reported that the discrimination and harassment continued. In February of 1992, she was promoted to ramp supervisor, a position that was originally given to a male co-worker. However, Sue had learned that he had illegally bid for the job and filed a grievance. After an investigation, she won and received the position instead. Shortly after her promotion, Sue found a graffiti drawing of a coffin with her name on it in her locker. She would often get calls in the middle of the night, and at one point, even her sister's vehicle was vandalized. The harassment had gotten so bad that someone urinated in her locker. Despite this, she continued to work harder and refused to let them run her off or stand in her way. She and her co-worker, Deborah, were involved in a meeting with Northwest that did not go well. 
During the meeting, Sue became upset and started to cry, and Deborah was concerned about the emotional toll that the harassment was causing in Sue's life. She told Deborah that she was scared, but did not elaborate on who she was scared of. Deborah believes that Sue was truly terrified for her life. The harassment continued, and then came September 12th when she mysteriously disappeared after leaving work to pick up food for her crew. Surprisingly, it would take a day and a half for her co-workers to report her missing. When she was later found dead, police suspected that her death may have been connected to a federal investigation of Northwest Airlines that took place in the summer preceding her murder. Beginning months before her murder, there was an investigation into a multi-million dollar scam coming out of the Northwest Terminal she worked in. It is believed that the persons behind the scam believed Sue was the one who blew the whistle on them. Some of the baggage handlers that she worked with were operating a stolen credit card ring. When shipments of new cards were transported by Northwest Jets, they would steal them and either sell them or use them for themselves. Ten of them were later arrested and convicted, some of which were named by her in her diary. Sue's family later settled a sexual harassment lawsuit with Northwest Airlines. Before Sue left work to go get the sandwiches on the night she vanished, she received a phone call from an unidentified person who wanted to meet her. Her family believes that the call was from someone Sue trusted who lured her to a meeting with her killer. Two prime suspects in the case are two of Sue's co-workers, Joseph Nuzo and Robert Brooks, also known as Bobby, two people she had several problems with. Nuzo had threatened Sue after she broke up a fight between him and another employee. As a result, he was suspended from work for six months. He blamed Sue for this and keyed her car, slashed her tires, staked out her house, made anonymous telephone calls, and told others that he would exact revenge. Shortly after Nuzo returned to work, they would start up the scam that would ultimately lead to their downfall. In August of 1992, several baggage handlers were subpoenaed by a grand jury, and Nuzo allegedly believed that Sue had told the police about the scheme. Two days later, he was fired, and only a few weeks after his firing, Sue was found dead. He was a crew chief at the airport and led the theft ring and would later be convicted for the scam. Nuzo, Brooks, and another worker named Edward Flaherty were among 35 people indicted in the massive credit card theft operation. Flaherty pleaded guilty to stealing credit cards from mail shipments from about April 1991 until July 1992 to pay off gambling debts and feed a cocaine habit. Not surprising, these three men were also the men who had been allegedly harassing Sue. Brooks moved out of the area prior to the murder and cooperated with police and later pleaded guilty to theft and fraud charges. However, he was later charged with lying to a federal grand jury. He claimed that he was working in another state on the night of Sue's murder and that he didn't talk to Nuzo on the day of Sue's murder. Both statements were proven to be false. There is no evidence that Sue was involved in helping with the investigation, and her family believes that Sue didn't even know about it until she read about it in the newspaper. Nuzo and Brooks remained suspects in her murder, along with Sue's other co-workers at Northwest. A $250,000 reward is being offered by her family for an arrest in the case, which as of today remains open and unsolved. Wesley Keith Billingsley was born August 17, 1993, and went by Wes. He graduated from San Diego State University in 2016 with a degree in Business Administration and Marketing. According to his Facebook page, he is the founder of BAM Enterprise, which appears to be a public relations agency, and co-founder of On Deck, which appears to be a lifestyle brand focusing on apparel, accessories, music, and events. He was originally from Sacramento, California, and moved back there for a short time after college and before returning to San Diego. He was described as free-spirited, positive, happy, and liked to make people smile. In 2018, at the age of 24, he had been working at an advertising agency but lost his job. Unable to make rent, he would lose his apartment and be forced to stay back and forth between three friends' homes in the Pacific Beach neighborhood. The friends lived on Haines Street, Diamond Street, and Grand Avenue. 
According to police, Pacific Beach is one of San Diego's high crime neighborhoods. He never told his mother, Crystal, about his current living situation, and she was under the impression that he was still working at the ad agency and living with his roommates in his previous apartment. On June 12, 2018, he would go missing and would never be seen again. He was supposed to meet with friends on June 13 to help them move, but never showed up. It was discovered that on June 12, his phone was turned off or went dead, and all social media interactions ceased, which is very unusual for him. Also that day, he drove by the Vaughn store, a place he frequented, and saw someone he knew. He would smile, wave, and keep driving. This is most likely the last person to see Wes. Two months after his disappearance, his Black Ford Expedition was found abandoned on a city street in the South Bay area of San Diego near the border of Mexico. Some of his personal belongings were still inside the vehicle, but there was no sign of him. It wasn't uncommon for people to park near the border and take a cab into Mexico, but it was uncommon for someone to do this alone, especially without telling anyone. However, there was no official evidence that he crossed the border that day. His mom later filed a missing persons report in Mexico. She also checked the jails and morgues but found nothing. His mother, Crystal, who lives in Sacramento, has repeatedly returned to San Diego to spread the word about her son's disappearance and beg for information. It is of note that Wes has eight tattoos on various places on his body and could easily be identified by this. She also wants people to remember that Crime Stoppers has a 100% anonymous tip line, which accepts tips via their app, phone number, or online using the web tip process. The tip line does not utilize caller ID and conversations are not recorded. The tip line is operated by Crime Stoppers and is not under law enforcement control. His mother remains devastated and as of today, Wes has never been found and this case remains unsolved. Brittany Shante Robinson was born January 27, 1998, to Demetri Cooper and Tiana Hope. Her parents would later separate, and Brittany would live with her mother full-time in Mobile, Alabama. Brittany and Demetri would occasionally spend some time together as she was growing up, but these occasions were few and far between. Demetri had allegedly struggled over the years with drug addiction and schizophrenia and had been charged at some point with domestic violence and assaulting a police officer. On June 14, 2012, her mother reluctantly agreed to allow 14-year-old Brittany to go to Demetri's home for two days in Dawes, Alabama. Her aunt, Demetri's sister, dropped her off at his house at 9 a.m. and sadly, Brittany would never be seen again. After not hearing from or seeing her daughter, Tiana called the police, who went to his house, but Demetri and Brittany were gone. A warrant was put out for his arrest a few weeks later for custodial interference. When she went missing, Demetri had left Alabama and went to Memphis, Tennessee, and then on July 7th, he took a bus from Tennessee to Arkansas, where police would find him in September at a mental health facility. While traveling around, Demetri reportedly hustled money off people by pretending to be a homeless person to get train and bus tickets. Upon being arrested, he told police that he did not know where Brittany was, but he did have her pink iPod on his person, along with a rope and knife. He changed his story once he was in custody, stating that he knew where she was and that she was safe, but wouldn't tell anyone where she was. He would change his story once again, stating that she'd never even come to see him. Meanwhile, he would continue to state that he would never hurt his daughter. Police would search his home in Mobile, but found no clues as to her whereabouts. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison for custodial interference in August 2014 and only served a few years before being released on good behavior terms. His attorney claimed Demetri wouldn't actually give up any information whatsoever about what happened to Brittany and threatened suicide all the time to get his way. Tiana said that he showed no concern or care regarding Brittany when she visited him in prison. Brittany's family created a Facebook page dedicated to finding her called Bring Brittany Shante Robinson Home. In 2019, Demetri offered to tell someone in the group what happened to Brittany and asked this person to meet him in person. 
However, he never showed up as planned. He also sent this person a meme of the Joker in a prison uniform with the caption, Don't get on my bad side. Brittany was supposed to begin her freshman year at Murphy High School in the fall of 2012 and had signed up for advanced placement courses. Demetric allegedly lives in Florida now, and as of today, Brittany has never been found and this case remains unsolved. Colin Gillis was born March 4, 1994, to John and Patricia and grew up in a small logging town named Tupper Lake, New York, surrounded by the Adirondack Mountains. He was described as gifted academically, having a great sense of humor, and liked to have fun. He graduated from Tupper Lake High School in 2011 with honors, where he played basketball and football. He then began his first year at the State University of New York at Brockport, lived in a dorm, and planned to attend medical school. On March 10, 2012, 18-year-old Colin was home from college on spring break in his close-knit hometown of Tupper Lake and was looking forward to reuniting with friends from high school. He would start the night by going to his friend's house, who lived just down the street from him. He would then get a ride with a group of friends to a house on Lincoln Avenue. It's unclear if he and his friends had made actual plans for the evening, but at some point, they decided to head to a party about five miles away on past Gungamay Road. This would be the worst decision of the night because not only were they not friends with this group, they were not even invited. While at the party, an argument broke out and Colin's nine friends decided it would be best to leave, but Colin himself refused to go. His friends could not figure out why he was so adamant about staying, but they weren't going to stick around to find out and left. With his friends gone, Colin was left with a group of people he barely knew and some he didn't know at all. Police stated that the party would eventually break up around 1.30 a.m. However, it's unclear if the earlier fight had anything to do with this, but it is believed that more than one fight broke out that night and Colin may have been involved in at least one of them. This is strange because Colin was described as a non-confrontational person and it is unclear how much he had to drink that night, if any. After the party broke up, he called a few friends to pick him up, leaving voicemails, but no one answered so he began walking and instead of going right towards his home, he went left on foot walking along the dark highway on Route 3 towards Piercefield. Right after leaving the party, around 1.30 a.m., two teens stopped and asked if he wanted a ride, but he declined. He was then seen walking west near the area of Setting Pole Dam Road on Route 3 at 1.45 a.m. A local named Austin later stated that he rode by Colin and asked him twice if he could give him a ride, but he declined, stating a friend was on the way to pick him up. However, there was no evidence that anyone was planning to pick him up. Austin would later be the subject of rumors in the small town as being involved in his disappearance. At some point, a passing motorist saw someone who fit Colin's description walking along the highway without a coat and acting strangely. He was concerned, as it is not the kind of road you would expect to see a pedestrian on in the middle of the night without a coat in the freezing temperatures. The motorist drove a few miles to the police department and reported him out of concern. He stated he didn't feel comfortable stopping and was returning from a trip with his mother in the car. Strangely, the man also reported that the young man was flailing his arms and he at first thought he was a hitchhiker, but then it looked like he wasn't. About 30 minutes later, a state trooper checked the area and found no one. Colin was at the party with his orange L.L. Bean backpack that had a reversible jacket inside. However, these items have never been located and it is unknown why he wasn't wearing his jacket when the passerby saw him. His parents reported him missing the next evening when he didn't return home. A massive four-day search ensued involving hundreds of volunteers, police, search and rescue, and forest rangers, as well as high-tech sonar equipment and a dive team. The temperature was reportedly in the teens the night he went missing. Investigators say Collins' driver's license and a tobacco pipe was found near Franklin, St. Lawrence County line, just feet away from where he was last seen. Collins' phone was last used at 1.30 a.m. on Sunday, March 11th, the morning he disappeared. 
There was snow on the ground and no signs of a struggle or accident could be seen and there was no evidence suggesting that he was the victim of a hit and run. Sadly, the case would go cold. Eight years after he disappeared, in November of 2020, a dig was performed on a property that was known to locals in the nearby town of Edwards as the Old Noble Farm. It was located over 50 miles from where Colin was last seen walking, but details about the search have not been released to the public. This was possibly related to rumors about two brothers named Austin and Nathan being involved and their family owning the land that was searched. The farmhouse located on the property has since burned down and Austin passed away in September of 2021. Colin's family and police believe that someone out there has information but is afraid of coming forward. The investigation is still ongoing, but as of today, this case remains unsolved. Teresa Corley was born June 1, 1959, to Pauline and Thomas and was one of nine children. She was described as upbeat, positive, friendly, and attractive, and was nicknamed Terry. At the age of 19, she lived in Bellingham, Massachusetts, and was in her second year at Holliston Junior College and had dreams of working in the medical field. On the night of December 5, 1978, Terry and her friends were celebrating the birthday of Terry's boyfriend and they all wound up partying at the train stop lounge on Depot Street in the nearby town of Franklin. She and her boyfriend would get into an argument, leaving her upset and wanting to leave. So at around 4 a.m., she would leave angry, upset, and intoxicated. Some reports say that no one in her group noticed she left, nor did they go after her. Other reports say that they refused to give her a ride, so she then attempted to hitchhike, which was not unusual for her. Three men caught up to her after she left the bar and would take her to the Presidential Arms Apartments on West Central Street in Franklin. It is believed she was then sexually assaulted by the three men. She asked them to let her go and quickly dressed and mistakenly put on one of her shoes and one of the men's shoes. Terry fled the apartment and attempted to make her way to her home in Bellingham, about three miles away. This is when she was picked up by a truck driver in the early morning hours. He would describe her as incoherent at times and had indicated she had been sexually assaulted and appeared very angry. He dropped her off just outside of Bellingham Police Station about 5 a.m., thinking she would go in but didn't wait to see. She was then seen about 5.30 a.m. by witnesses on Main Street near Dairy Queen heading in the direction of her home. That morning, her mother awoke and realized Terry had not come home, which was something she had never done before. At this point, her mother, two sisters, and friends began searching for her. Allegedly, one of the attackers that night by the name of Steve had gone into the Alpine Place Apartments where Terry's boyfriend lived and claimed he was looking for someone. He has been questioned by police numerous times over the years, but has not revealed any details. Interestingly enough, his uncle was a Franklin police detective, and allegedly Steve reached out to his uncle immediately after Terry went missing. Three days after she was last seen, a businessman from Connecticut by the name of John Burlington called the police station's business line to report that he had pulled off to the side of the road to relieve himself and had seen a nude woman's body. Sadly, she was found strangled to death off the northbound lane of Interstate 495 on the Bellingham Medway town line. Strangely, police would discover that John Burlington, the person who reported the body, didn't even exist in Connecticut. They believed the person was actually a Bellingham resident and had given a false name. John Burlington's real identity has never been discovered. And as for the men who officials say allegedly assaulted Terry on her last night of life were questioned but never charged with any crime in relation to the case. In 2018, Terry's body was exhumed in hopes of obtaining a DNA sample. A state police chemist collected nine and a half fingernails to analyze for DNA in hopes of identifying the person responsible for her murder. However, the samples were too degraded to produce a full DNA profile, but male DNA was found on her genes, but has not been matched to any suspects. According to her sister, there were several key pieces of evidence in Terry's case that were either lost or accidentally destroyed. 
As of today, her sexual attackers have never been arrested, nor has her murderer been found, and this case remains unsolved.